little snack bubble. We'll have more room more Alright, let's get started! I think our director is saying we should get started. <laughs> You can do that. Vampires. <laughs> They're right to kill. We're good to start. <laughs> oh, excellent. That's the signal. Oh. 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 Hi, everybody, and welcome to season three, episode two of Knights at the Round Table. Today, we are discussing the book Battlefield Earth by L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, and there are only two of us today, so I'm going to just jump right in and go, what were your impressions of the book, Bill? This time around? <laughs> <laughs> I've read it a couple times. Now, admittedly, the uh, first couple times was when I was younger, much younger, but this time around I had troubles reading it. For the first probably third of the book, I had troubles trying to get John Travolta out of my head as the character uh -huh. <laughs> Uh But it is... Uh, I think I've matured in my reading skill or uh, levels and stuff. It's very, I guess to quote somebody, a Pulp Fiction type of uh, read, you know. So mm. I think that's basically because uh, the author wrote this probably towards the end of his life. And prior to that, his science fiction days were in the early 30s, 40s time frame. <laughs> and so at that time, the fiction was sort of pulpy. So it was, it was a good book. But I try not to read too much into it because it's <laughs> <laughs> and so forth. Okay, by contrast, I hated this book. <laughs> I really did. Reading is very rarely a slog for me. This book made it the most tedious activity I could possibly be doing. Um, which is sad because the basic premise is actually really good. It's just so poorly executed with such one-dimensional characters and uh, so many so many issues uh, you said that his his early sci-fi stuff was in the 30s and 40s it shows um, both in uh, the execution of the story and in the portrayal of the characters the bad guys are just evil just because um, and it makes no sense really and the women are there. Barely even there, and matter not one whit, and Chrissy annoyed the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, the hero was very Aryan, and that for some reason really annoyed me. Um, like right off the bat, his description annoyed me. I don't know why, because it's often the case in these kind of things that you know the yeah. hero is blonde and blue eyed and very white. <laughs> I guess in the year three thousand. Black men just didn't survive, <laughs> or something. Indigenous populations in America, non-existent. They're all white, all of them. Yeah, that might go with his, because he was, from what I've read, is very racist. Oh, was he? Yes. Well, that makes sense then. <laughs> from what I could tell, he was very racist. Uh, well, it kind of shows through in his writing. I don't think he thought much of women either, to be honest. Yeah, uh, yeah I had a lot of problems with this book. Um, I'm going to start with the bad guys who were dumb as posts, really stupid. Just I can't I can't even like tell you how much I disliked the bad guys. I get that they had uh, things put into their brain to you know take away their empathy, therefore making it like slavery, them making slaves of people not an issue for them because they've lost all their empathy but I think they lost all of their brains when those things were implanted yep. as well um, because clearly like he states in the book that these bad guys were aware of human cities and that humans had technology and they read um, and were clearly advanced but then they go around acting as if humans weren't advanced for any reason whatsoever and it's nothing more than plot convenience because they talk about man books and they talk about human cities and it's it, it just it, the disconnect it could have worked if they had admitted that humans were intelligent if even if they weren't choosing to enslave them you know, they were yeah. at least intelligent just not as good as us kind of therefore yeah. they deserve to be enslaved that would have worked way better than the well humans are clearly just animals when they're reading human books and doing yeah. human mathematics and what the 
it didn't make sense. <laughs> it didn't make mm-hmm. sense, and it really bugged me the whole way through the book. There was a whole arrogance of these guys. <laughs> well, yes, but you can be like, yeah. colonialists were arrogant as hell, yeah. but I mean, there's a way to do it and a way to do it, and it was not done well in this book. And nope. I'm very sad because the premise is amazing. Yeah. It's a good idea. It was a good idea. It could have probably been broken down to a couple books as uh, well. <laughs> or, you know, just get rid of the entire beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and the entire end. And the entire... Uh, well, no, yeah. see, no. I like the end because it wrapped things up even yeah. if it enraged me a lot. Um, especially with, you know, yeah. Missy being content with learning women's work. <laughs> yeah, that, actually, that is nice. It sort of ended the story. You knew it wasn't going to carry on. <laughs> yeah, well, it might have carried on because Johnny, good boy, Tyler, disappears yes. at the end. So, so if you didn't really know who the good guy was, it was given to you. Yeah, by in his the name, name. <laughs> good boy. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah, I agree with you. The characters are very one-dimensional. Um, There's a lot of review and talk about the fact that the bad guys, the cyclos were actually part of uh, L. Ron Hubbard's, um, I don't know, uh, hatred for psychologists and psychiatrists. That, that was very apparent yeah. right at the end. Yeah. yeah. So he had he didn't really care for that particular branch of science because it probably messed with his own views. Mm-hmm. Um, there are also um, other things about uh, the author. Uh, we'll go a little, I guess we'll go to the author. Was, from what I could tell, he was a bit of a madman. He was very arrogant um, to the point of he made things up in his own life. Things were not actually as he portrayed them. Uh, you know, like to the point of outright complete misinformation. Oh, really? Yeah. See, I don't know much about L. Ron Hubbard other than the whole, like, he founded Scientology thing. Yeah. And as distasteful as I find Scientology, you know, to each their own, I guess. So, so I didn't really look into it yeah. all that much. One of the other things is, this book actually made New York Times bestseller list. I read that and then got confused. <laughs> when you read the book? No, when I read that it had made the New York yeah. Times bestseller list. <laughs> well, really. Yeah, uh, part of that actually, uh, there's a lot of uh, controversy over that. In the sense that oh, the, yeah, the... the Church of Scientology got behind it. And started selling it and buying up copies through oh, that just to push its numbers how... up. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So I thought. Oh, well, that is kind sneak. of that's sneaky. That's scary. So, I don't like that. So what we're going to do is take Sonia's books and we're going to go buy them out of stores. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck finding them in stores. <laughs> Sorry, Sonia. Uh, so yeah, I guess that's how it hit the bestsellers list. Was yeah. basically that controversy. They go out because there were stories. The fact that books uh, booksellers would get their books, would get a box of books, and their price tags were already on it still. So basically, they bought the books and returned them to the publisher. And <laughs> yeah. So. Oh well, that's kind of sneaky. That explains why it hit the bestseller list. Because yeah. there's, I agree. I don't think it ever was a bestseller. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was looking on Goodreads um, about this book, and the, the the reviews varied wildly. Like there were a ton of five stars saying this book is epic; it's the best book ever <laughs> yeah. written, and there were a ton of one stars saying this book is utter garbage. One of my favorites was actually um, a Goodreads reviewer by the name of Teresa whose first line of her re- one-star review was, the best part about this book was when I used it to kill a wasp. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even get to do that, Teresa! <laughs> uh, uh, one of the uh, other ones, I was one of the other reviews I looked at, who sort of, sort of removed the Scientology behind it, whatever, just read it for what it was. Yeah. He was embarrassed to read it, so he ripped the cover off it when he was reading it out in public. Oh my god, really? Yeah. Is it? I didn't know it was that controversial. Holy Well, god. partly it wasn't so much that. Well, I think probably he read it shortly after the movie came out. And of course, the movie ended up with as labeled as the worst movie ever. Yeah, well, in the movie's defense, <laughs> look at the source material. <laughs> <laughs> I think honestly, I think the movie started off in the place the book should have started off, with yeah. humanity already enslaved and working for the yeah. silos instead of just roving bands of Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um and the book is long. It is really, really unnecessarily long. 
I could have forgiven most anything if the prose had been beautiful, the way mm. that Tolkien makes his prose beautiful, or uh, Stephen Erickson makes his prose beautiful for equally long books. But there were only a, f a couple of flashes of really beautiful prose, and then the rest was just straightforward, sort of what you would expect a, a graduating high school student to be able to achieve. Sorry, Mr. Hubbard, but it, it wasn't it wasn't brilliant stuff. Um, and part of my issue was uh, the way he foreshadowed stuff. Inst there are ways you can foreshadow in stories where it's sort of subtle, and when you read the thing that happens, the reader goes, "Oh, oh, right! They mentioned that this way." But he just outright says it with <laughs> lines like, "He would kick himself later." <laughs> I mean, it pulled me right out of the story. I was just getting into it, and then I read, he would kick himself later, and I'm like, ugh, I'm out again. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Can't handle. <sighs> I can cross that off my list. That was a big beef with me, yeah. is the way he foreshadowed yeah. stuff. I think it probably would have taken me longer to read this this last time, but I was trying to finish it so you can have the book. Oh. <laughs> so I pushed myself to read it as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like I said, I think I've grown as a reader, I think, since I first read it back in high school. Yeah, and um, I can totally understand why, say, like a 13-year-old boy would love this book. Yeah. I mean, the main 13-year-old white boy would love this book. <laughs> I mean, the main character is a young man, um, and he starts off being incredibly arrogant the way that teenagers are. He knows better than his elders, and he's going to go out in the world and prove it. Now, in this fantasy, he does go out and prove that he knows better than his elders. It doesn't work quite like that in the real world, but I understand the attraction for yeah. young men who often think like that when they're teenagers. I, I know best. And I know what's going to happen in my life, and I'm going to go out and I'm going to get it. And they're all like that before... Uh, you know, life knocks them back a bit and then they become yeah. cynical old men. <laughs> or, women. <laughs> or women. Or women. Um, in the reviews for Battlefield Earth that I was reading, uh, there was a lot of talk about the shoddy science in this science fiction. Um, and I was wondering if anything caught your eye because I don't pay too much attention to the science in science fiction, mm. which is weird, I know. Um, so it didn't bother me that much that the science was a bit. It didn't off. really bother me all that much. Part of it did it uh, did it it didn't it just. I'm just trying to think he he did his science is awfully black boxes, right? How do you mean? Like, you put something in, something comes out. That's mm -hmm. a black box, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? No, there was no real explanation of how it was. They yes, sorry, that just reminded me of when we read Red, Red Shirts, which had a literal black box. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, as an engineer, we deal black box, you know, sometimes do stuff black box, like, as well, but their whole the whole science seemed to be that way, and I think he tried to explain it off towards the end with the uh, fact that only the security officers, which baffled me completely, were the only ones with the skills for mathematics. Oh yeah, and Terrell was one, right? And Terrell was one, exactly. And hence, the only way he could actually, you know, he's the only one who could build the stuff. But like I said, it's even like even going down when he was building the circuit board, it was seen very much. Yeah, I'll just put this component here. Who cares what the component does? It just does. It just does. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then he tries to explain that again because it's a layer upon layer upon layer of deception, shall we say? Yeah. Maybe that's Which. Again, is a brilliant idea yeah. of having basically these performing mummers take over their own people and yeah. turn it into an empire. Yeah. But God, those people were so dumb, I have no idea how they managed <laughs> to have an empire. <laughs> they were really dumb! I have to go back and think on, there's got to be at least a brain somewhere central. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah no, something. Because... The characters they showed are definitely weren't the most intelligent. They were very yeah. greedy, only, which, uh, only for themselves. Yeah, which again, it would work if there was something more to them, but there really wasn't. I mean, <laughs> they were they ship their the bodies of their dead back to their home world, um, and one of the reasons they said they did this we was because. They were afraid that some alien race that they had enslaved would perform an autopsy. But then they didn't really believe in the sentience of the alien races they enslaved. So Or dealt with. 
or dealt with. <laughs> so it the the reasoning just didn't work at all at all. And left me sitting there when I read that going But you did you just spent the whole book going I You know, I think he may have been trying or the, not I'm just saying, the whole idea of the concept may be that they shipped him back home so that nobody performed an autopsy, not even their own people. Yeah, because but they, they didn't, didn't say they didn't really want their own people knowing that there was something in their heads. Yeah, but they didn't say that. No, I know. They said that they were worried that some alien race would perform yeah. an autopsy. And obviously in order to perform an autopsy, you have to be fairly sophisticated, uh understatement of the year. <laughs> um and but they didn't I just it, none of it made sense. It I it could have been done so much better. The basic seeds of a really brilliant epic science fiction were there. But the execution was just so poor that I couldn't... It was a struggle to read. Yeah. yeah. I. <laughs> one of the things that also made me laugh was right at the end of the book when he was talking about rebuilding Edinburgh. And he's... Somewhere in the book he had written something like uh, they didn't know how the Scottish would pay for it. So he paid for it all himself. Because uh, they were talking taxation. And then he went, but you know... Back in the old days when Scotland had a king, there was no taxation. The king just paid for it all. <laughs> That's not how it worked. That's not how... This is not how it works. This is not how any of this works. <laughs> <laughs> the king got the money via taxation. I mean... I mean <laughs> well, his, uh, his sense of reality was definitely skewed. Uh, yes, it was. Or his oh, belief on reality. <laughs> you know, one of the things I did appreciate was the mention of the Scottish tribe, the Bagrantes. Granted, in this book, there were smelly cannibals because they were bad guys, and obviously all bad guys are smelly in this book. Um, but at least he mentioned them because the Bagantes <laughs> were an actual tribe that did live in Scotland in the Iron Age, so yay. <laughs> These guys were down in South Africa, weren't they? Or no, no, that was in Scotland, I'm oh, pretty sure. Okay. I might be wrong. I, I thought it was in Scotland. I don't know. Was it all it blurs cannibals? together. Yeah, the cannibals. Yeah, they were in Africa. They were in Africa. They were in Africa. Oh, whoops! <laughs> <laughs> they may have. Been, they may have been actually. I think they were actually at one point a Scottish mercenary brigade. I think he explained. Oh, that's where I got it from. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, I was paying attention, and by the time I reached that, <laughs> yeah. that part of the Jeez, I. I re how did I remember that? I read that over six months ago. Oh gosh. And there were other things that yeah. were disconnected as well, like. Um. When the wonderful jo Johnny good boy Tyler, who is so wonderful, he kills a grizzly bear with nothing more than a club. A big club. Because he chose the big club. Yeah, the kill club. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> this was my exact response, by the way, when I read that. Anyway. <laughs> Saving um, Terrell's life, too. He did. He saved yeah. Terrell's life. He had a blaster and yeah. then did nothing with it. And not five page later... Five pages later, he said, escape was his first priority. And I just sat there for a while going, you had a blaster. It was you and Turl and no one else. If escape was your first priority, <laughs> yeah. you would have done it. Yeah. You don't make sense. I think sense. I checked my brain out when I started reading this because I knew what kind of book it was. Uh, yeah, but even even then, even then, you, uh, there are some books that are just mindless fun, sort yeah. of fluff reads. I would account David Edding's Elenium series as sort of... Yeah. Mi relatively minus sort of fluffy pieces yeah. um, where the characters are equally as one dimensional but the execution was by far better yeah well exactly uh, well it's like going to some movies you sit there and you go, yeah I know what kind of movie this is going to be so I'll check the brain at the door yeah, and, and just, enjoy just, myself. just enjoy the movie enjoy yeah. myself yeah I couldn't even do that I was just yeah. pulled out of the movies uh, out of the movie out, out of, of the, the book, book so often like yeah. for example the use of tapes when he was creating a mutiny threat, like he taped people and he literally he physically oh, right. cut the tapes and glued them back together and then recorded it on a separate separate tape. This is a, a civilization that crosses galaxies and has hovercrafts <laughs> and they're using tapes. Which would probably be what they did in the 1930s, 1940s. Yes, but <laughs> science fiction is supposed to be forward looking. Tapes are not forward looking, and it pulled me right out again. I'm like, oh, this is relative. Oh no, no, it's not. It's not clever at all. <laughs> nope. It goes back to his. He didn't learn anything between 1940 and 1980. Uh, I know. But, and it reads very like. 
his 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 portrayal of women um, has been done better by earlier writers in science fiction. Honestly, they were literally just there. Chrissy was there to pine for Johnny. Missy yeah. was there just because he wanted a daughter, I guess, to do the women's work and be obedient and learn her. She was no trouble at all. It was Johnny's son, whose name I forget now. <laughs> who was the who was the troublemaker? Which made me sad. I would have loved to have Missy go off and learn tracking and stuff, and Johnny be yeah. upset about it. <laughs> I would say even a uh, female cycles had probably more thought they, put to them. They did, yeah. Um, I forget her name. Chir- Chir- Chiro or Chir- Charo? Charo, something like that. Uh, she was okay. I mm-hmm. liked her. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, she reminds me of. Oh, I'm trying to remember who, who she reminded me of back then, but some sort of like a secretary who keeps care of the boss, you know. Yeah, but and, and, and then and again, if you need information, that's who you go talk to, not the boss. But then again, yeah, secretary. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I had so many issues, <laughs> and I'm very upset about it actually because it could have been good, it could have been brilliant, and it wasn't, and it makes me sad. Yeah. It was, uh, like I said, I, I enjoyed it, but then again, I checked my brain at the door. Oh, uh, yeah. When okay. I started and reading. also, yeah, you and also I, have the nostalgia factor. And I had a nostalgic factor. Yeah, exactly. yeah, which was the same with me for Overseas yeah. Under Stone. I mean, I still love that book, but I'm pretty sure most of it is nostalgia. Yeah. Yeah. But I just couldn't get John Travolta out of my head when I was reading this stupid <laughs> thing. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Ironically, Which, not one of my problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had actually seen the bo- uh, the movies, so. oh, yeah. right. but I also found out that apparently uh, when they published this, the whole idea was it was going to have a sequel. Believe it or not, it was going to have a sequel, and they had already been planning the movie rights and the movie deals. Oh wow! Right, okay. although it took them sixteen years to actually get there, and John Travolta was supposed to play Johnny, actually originally. Oh really? Yeah, oh. that was the whole plan. Well, he's a Scientologist well, himself, yes, I know. so okay. I, uh, so, but anyways, that was the whole plan. But and then, of course, uh, John Travolta, who directed the movie as well, realized that he's much too old for John to play the character of Johnny, so went into the role of Terrell. Well, there you go. So we won't put that bo- uh, that movie into the bowl, right? Well, we might just in <laughs> case we need something to rag on. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> I think we've said everything. Is there anything else that you want to add to this? Uh, there was a point, and I'm just trying to remember what it was. We all sort of swung past things so fast yeah, sometimes. Yeah. And, um, but right at the moment, I can't think of anything at the moment. It might pop into my head later on, unfortunately. But Yeah, yeah. That. So, no, I don't have anything else at this point. No, neither do I. What about you at home? Do you have thoughts on this book? Have you read it? Leave a comment down below, or you can uh, join in the conversation on our Goodreads group. I'll leave a link for that down below. Um, I'll just jump through to star ratings now. Bill? Well, I had originally given it a three, but as we discussed earlier, it was more of a two and a half, uh, probably mainly because of the nostalgic factor. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? And my fond memories of it when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, I, I totally get. Um, one, because Goodreads doesn't allow you to have a zero star rating on a book. <laughs> Honestly, the only book I have detested to the same level as this book was uh, Into the Gap. Which... I'll post a link up. We've already reviewed that. At least, uh, and none of the Into the Gap stuff was technical issues. I had a lot of technical issues with this book. Um, so yeah, one star, uh, and at least Into the Gap was only 200 pages of rubbish. <laughs> it was <laughs> over a thousand. <laughs> Agree, disagree, leave a comment. Uh, time to choose the next book, Bill. The Day of the Triffids by John Ooh, Wyndham. Yay! Day of the Triffids. So that's what we'll be reading in two weeks' time. Uh, next week is the movie we are reviewing. <sighs> the Exorcist! <laughs> the Exorcist! 1973. Thank you, camera people. <laughs> that might even be hissed across the... <laughs> yeah, it will be. No, it will be. My brain has ceased to function. I blame the rum. All right. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Give a like and subscribe, and we will see you next week. Bye. Good. We are good.